The fate of the 200 schoolgirls remains essentially unknown. In fact, just yesterday on the anniversary, the new president of Nigeria, President Buhari, essentially acknowledged that it's going to be very, very difficult to bring back the Chibok schoolgirls. Hi, my name is Kaj Larson, Vice News Correspondent. And this week on Vice News, we released the full-length film documentary called The War on Boko Haram. And it was an experience where I was embedded as the only journalist in Northeast Nigeria with the Nigerian army. Uh, during, over the course of the 30-minute film, you get to hear from soldiers who are fighting the war against the insurgent terrorist group. You get to hear from refugees or internally displaced people uh, who have been victims of Boko Haram. And you get to see me in combat, um, embedded with different uh, military units that are fighting in this conflict. Um, I'm here today on the line to uh, take some questions and talk about anything and everything regarding the war against Boko Haram. Well, hey, Kaj, thanks for uh, joining us today. So our first caller is Francis, who's calling us on Skype from Washington, D.C. Hi, Kaj. Hi, Francis. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And it's so nice to finally meet you. I really enjoyed your documentary. I did have uh, two questions. The first is, what's the closest anyone's been to finding these children and rescuing them? And the second, you know, comes off of your documentary. I saw that a lot of Boko Haram's military strongholds were in schools. I wonder why that is. Great. Well, Francis, thank you, first of all, for joining us from the nation's capital. Um, and let's talk about the Chibok schoolgirls, right? These are the 200, over 200 girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram a year ago yesterday. Yesterday was the anniversary, uh, the one-year anniversary, sad anniversary, of these school children being captured. And for a little historical context, I think it's really important and significant that most Americans, and frankly internationally, Nigeria and the conflict in northern Nigeria, it wasn't even on their radar until um, the girls were captured. And then obviously you saw it go viral. You saw in the film and documentary, even uh, First Lady Michelle Obama was tweeting and hashtagging bring back our girls. So it was this incredible viral social phenomena and the meta effect was almost zero, right? To date, uh, the only girls who have been returned were 50 or so girls who were able to escape during the actual initial uh, point of capture, right? So the fate of the 200 schoolgirls remains essentially unknown, right? And the feeling on the ground in northern Nigeria, the intel sources from the uh, Nigerian army, the, the prospects are not good. In fact, just yesterday on the anniversary, the new president of Nigeria, President Buhari, essentially acknowledged that it's going to be very, very difficult to bring back the Chibok schoolgirls. And in point of fact, most people's sentiment on the ground is that the Chibok schoolgirls are now Chibok moms, right? And most of them have been married off um, to Boko Haram fighters. They've actually found, they have some intel sources that say a couple have been moved as far north as Mauritania and Mali through this sort of transnational movement of insurgents. Um, so that is not very encouraging. Um, what is also significant to understand about this is that the Chibok schoolgirls uh, are just the most well-known example of people being kidnapped and terrorized in Northeast Nigeria. I want to take a look at this clip from the documentary from another school that I was in. It's about two hours from where the Chibok schoolgirls were taken. So basically, this is the old Kunduga Girls Elementary School. Um, it's now being occupied and used as the brigade headquarters for the army. You have soldiers sleeping in classrooms. Um, the old principal's office is now the operations office. So this used to be the guidance counselor building. Um, now it's a depot for ammunition. RPG rounds laying around. So this one's the old uh, mathematics lab. You can see this is where the students used to stay and study. Still says mathematics and ratio on the board. You can see this, this whole place is just bombed out. Two schools that used to be places of learning and education had now become graveyards. 
And Francis, the reason I wanted you to see that clip is because that school actually had somewhere between 20 and 25 schoolgirls who were taken about the same age as the Chibok schoolgirls. So what I want to describe is this is a regional problem that's affected actually 1.5 million people. 1.5 million people have been displaced from their homes in northeast Nigeria. 15,000 approximately have been killed. And hundreds, if not thousands, of girls have, have been kidnapped just like Chibok. So, um, I wish I had better news. There's some intel about small pockets of the schoolgirls where they know, but for the most part, uh, the general consensus is, is that the prognosis is, is not good for their fate. And forgive me, I forgot your second question. Please, please remind me. My second question actually relates to the clip you just showed. Um, I noticed in your documentary you had two clips showing two schools that were military strongholds. And I wondered why that is. Is that a pattern that you saw in Nigeria? Or is that something that's, you know, common for that um, region, you know, including Mauritania, anywhere that's been affected by Boko Haram? Yeah. I, I don't really know. I think in some ways it's this great cosmic irony that Boko Haram uh, whose name loosely translate to Western education is forbidden, right, has now managed to create conflict in many of the schoolhouses where Western education was occurring. So in some ways, they've actually accomplished their mission, right, because they've prevented education from happening because hundreds and hundreds of schools across northeastern Nigeria, just like the one you saw in the clip and just like the Chibok school, have been closed because of the insecurity. The Chibok school, incidentally, had been closed for six months or, uh, or something, and they had just opened for final exams that day when the girls were kidnapped. So, uh, yes, the unfortunate reality is that schools, places of learning and education, have now become places of conflict. In order to reverse that trend, um, they're going to have to stabilize the security situation in northeastern Nigeria. That's all the bad news. The good news is that the actual prescription, the actual remedy for things getting better on the ground in northeast Nigeria, long term, the sustainable solution is to reopen those schools and to keep education thriving and going in the region. Okay, thank you so much, Kaj. Thank you so much for your question. All right, so let's uh, get ready to say hey to our next caller. Uh, we have Dickens on Skype, who is calling us from Palo Alto, California. Hey, hey, Kaj, uh, great report. Um, I have a few questions for you. So at the end of your report, you say that taking, Boko, uh, taking Bama was a victory for the Nigerian army and other mercenaries. Uh, could you talk more about that? And I also want you to maybe comment about the soldiers' sense of mission and morale. And maybe my last question, I'm curious about how the soldiers were received by the locals. Great. Well, great questions. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give... A shout out to Northern California. You're about 30 minutes from, from my hometown, so I, I appreciate the NorCal pride and I appreciate the questions. Uh, your first question related to the Nigerian army and uh, the mercenaries taking Bama. Um, so what's important to understand about this is that there were many um, combatants and non-combatants on the ground from different groups, right? There was Chadian army troops presence, there was Cameroonian troops present. This is all part of the multinational task force that has coalesced to route northern Nigeria of Boko Haram, right? As part of that, it was widely acknowledged, it was acknowledged by President Goodluck Jonathan that he hired I'll use the term private military contractors versus the more salacious term mercenaries, that he hired private military contractors for technical training and assistance. It was also acknowledged by the leader of one of these companies, a man named Eben Barlow, um, in an interview that in addition to providing that training and technical assistance, they also provided a fully operational air wing. And you see a, uh, a clip of me embedded with that operational air wing in the latter half of the documentary. So there has been a lot of ballyhoo and a lot of media and international media reports about the presence of private military contractors. Uh, and there's also been a lot of reporting about the Chadian and the Cameroonian forces, right? 
What's most significant for me, though, to put this in a really, really broader big picture context is that despite the presence of all of those other actors, I found most of them to be peripheral to the actual conflict, that the primary engagement was being done by the Nigerian military. Because at the end of the day, this is a Nigerian story. And this solution has to occur from the Nigerian military. And my experience, boots on the ground, was that they were actually the thrust of the effort. Uh, but if I can just follow up, I mean, I, I watched the report, and, uh, your story, and what really amazed me was just how, um, you know, the morale of the troops seemed really high. The, there was some really strong sense of the mission. But then the earlier report before the six-week surge was that uh, the Nigerian soldiers were abandoning their posts and they were fleeing. And, you know, I was just trying to reconcile the two. What happened uh, during the surge that was not happening, you know, uh, b before, you know, they postponed the election to, to go after Boko Haram? Yes, it, it's, it's, it's actually a great question um, because, like many things in combat and conflict, both sides are simultaneous true simultaneously true. The Nigerian army had problems with morale. They had problems of being underfunded and under-equipped. And you can't examine this without looking at it in the context of the political landscape at the time, right? Boko Haram was effectively ignored since really its main inception in 2009. It started way back in 2002 in Mataguri. It really took off in 2009 when Shikau took over its leadership. And that's when it became violent and virulent uh, in northern Nigeria. But when you really examine the situation, it was effectively ignored since 2009. That's what allowed them to operate as a semi-conventional force and occupy territory and take towns uh, and really kind of inflict the havoc that they did um, right up until the point of the presidential re-election. And it was at that critical moment that the former president, good luck Jonathan, realized that he was in dire electoral straits. And so the Nigerian military deployed to Northeast Nigeria prior to the election was, had low morale, was under-equipped, was underfunded. Then there was this massive escalation, which some saw as an election ploy um, in order to help get President Goodluck Jonathan reelected, which we all know ultimately didn't work. But that infusion of cash and that infusion of will uh, by the Nigerian army to actually make an offensive against uh, Boko Haram, there were elements of those soldiers who very much believed in, in the mission and very much believed in the fight, partially because some of them had personal relationships. I want to show you one soldier, Captain Michelle, who I spent time with on the very, very front lines, uh, who had a direct relationship to the conflict. Let's take a look at that. Captain Michelle was another soldier who had a special relationship to Madaguri. It happens to be my state. As I'm talking to you, my parents are in Meduguri. They have been displaced from my own village, Shafa. So, what do you expect me to do? Yeah. I just have to do this. Even if I'm here, even if I'm not here, if I am asked, will you come here voluntarily? I will come because my family is in Meduguri. So he's an example of someone whose family is literally 30 kilometers away, living as refugees or more technically internally displaced people in a, a, a very like poor community in modern Greece. So for him, it was a very personal fight. His morale was extremely high and he was extremely committed to the fight. That being said, absolutely there were soldiers who have been deployed up there for a year and were burnt out. I, I think that's part of the natural course of warfare. Great, and could you please just comment on how the locals received uh, the Nigerian troops? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you want to, I personally want to be very careful to sort of generalize, um, but the overall sentiment that I received was uh, actually gratitude towards the soldiers for the most part. Um, and the reason being that with 1.5 million refugees, with so many people impacted by the conflict, you, it's really hard to describe how much the entire region had been affected by the sort of campaign of terror that Boko Haram had done. So I spoke to locals um, who had lost children to suicide bombings right there in Mataguri. I was at a market uh, where two days later, 54 people were killed in a suicide attack. 
Madaguri, which is a thriving city, you know, it's, um, you know, it's not, it's not Nairobi, it's not Lagos, but it's a big functioning city, has a 7 p.m. curfew. Nobody can be on the streets after 7 p.m. Schools are empty, villages are empty. The refugee crisis has put economic and, and, and social pressure on, all, on, on the entire city of Madaguri because there's not enough resources to support them. So what I'm trying to describe is an entire region that's been impacted. And because of that, most of the locals were extremely grateful uh, that at least there was some action finally being taken. So th there was a lot of gratitude towards the soldiers. That being said, um, they were also very much skeptical of the reasons and the rationale, especially in northern Nigeria, which was a pro-Buhari region. Uh, they very much saw it as President Goodluck Jonathan trying to reassure his, his election win. Thank you, Kyle. That was great. It was wonderful speaking with you. Thank you for joining us. So that was a great answer. Uh, Kaj, we have a video message from Dominic who sent this to us from Germany. So let's take a listen. Hi, Kaj. I really liked your report on the fight against uh, Boko Haram. However, Human Rights Watch has um, reported many human rights abuses committed by the Nigerian security forces themselves. So I was wondering in general, how does being embedded with a fighting force in battle um, affect the maybe the objectivity of, of uh, reporting on a conflict? Well, thank you for the question. And I think it, there's an incredible amount of validity to your question. I think it 100% affects your objectivity. You could go back to Tory Clark's decision during the Bush administration to embed U.S. reporters with American troops. And um, one of the critiques of that is that it was a strategic move in order to gain favorable media coverage of American troops. Um, and one can make a strong argument that that worked, right? There's no denying that it's human nature that if you are sitting in a trench next to a guy while people are shooting at you or mortaring you and he's firing back and you're somewhat um, under his blanket of protection uh, or there's at the very least a camaraderie between being under fire together, that that is gonna make you predisposed to their beliefs and their ideas. Um, I, I, I think the key as a journalist is to acknowledge that that internal element, to acknowledge that emotional element, and then to move beyond it by doing your due diligence and reporting from multiple dimensions and multiple angles of the conflict, right? So you, you look at the conflict from different vantage points. So for example, in my uh, war against Boko Haram, I obviously couldn't embed with the Boko Haram fighters, but I could talk to refugees in Madaguri who had been displaced. I could go and talk to soldiers from different elements, those who were at the front lines and those who were in the rear with the gear. Um, and I think by piecing together a sort of cornucopia of different perspectives, that's how you inoculate yourself uh, against what's a natural bias uh, to feel the same thing as a, a soldier fighting. Um, at the same time, uh, it's a real perspective. It's, it's a walk a mile in my boots perspective to understand what those soldiers are going through. Um, uh, at the beginning of your question, you mentioned something about human rights uh, with the uh, about human rights violations by the Nigerian army. Absolutely, those reports were rampant, and there's probably validity to many of them. I obviously personally didn't witness um, any of that stuff, but I think it is from a historical perspective, important to acknowledge that the beginning of the main thrust of the Boko Haram insurgency occurred in 2009, after its original leader, Mohamed Youssef, was killed in an extrajudicial killing by Nigerian security forces. And in a law of unintended consequences kind of way, that sparked Shakao taking over, who turned out to be way more ruthless, way more violent, way more bloodthirsty, right? So atrocities occur in wartime, um, and sometimes those turn out to be strategic errors um, by the government forces. And I think looking at back at 2009, that's the case. 
So uh, thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. All right. So uh, I've got a tweet I want you to take a look at here for a second, Kaj. Rune is asking uh, if you think it's possible for the conflict to be solved by military measures. And actually, before you answer that, let's uh, let's pull Michael up. Uh, Michael's calling us from Denmark, and I think he has a question that's pretty similar to that. So let's say to Michael. Yeah, hello, Kaj. Hello, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, looking at so many different countries and conflicts in Africa, after the conflict has been dealt with, uh, the conflict seems to uh, reoccur somehow. Um, so my question is, aren't the Nigerians afraid that uh, other terror groups would form if the Boko Haram is defeated? I, I think the very short and simple answer to your very important question is absolutely. In any conflict, it's really important to look at the systemic root causes uh, of the conflict itself. And in this case, um, it's negligent to ignore the disparity, the economic disparity between northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria. Southern Nigeria is a very oil rich region. Uh, it has much more developed infrastructure, everything, uh, all of the standard metrics on the development index are much higher. In fact, Nigeria is, you know, the largest economy in Africa, it's the most populous nation in Africa, right? This is a thriving nation, but those statistics are really relegated to the south, uh, and it is not reflective of the situation in the north. Um, now they're lacking natural resources, but there hasn't been a trickle-up effect to northern Nigeria, and that coupled with uh, a, a lack of government presence um, certainly our, and, and the, the, some of the educational issues that we had discussed previously in the segment, all of those factors coalesce and coagulate to form the situation that became a breeding ground for Boko Haram, right? So as Stan McChrystal famously said about the U.S. and Afghanistan, we can't shoot our way out of this problem. And yeah. neither can the northern Nigerians just go there, kill a bunch of Boko Haram guys, and expect, you know, a renaissance in northern Nigeria. It's, it's not logical and there's, it, it's absolutely impossible. Um, that being said, it is, their strategy is not obtuse, right? They absolutely have to, just like challenges with counterinsurgency elsewhere in the world, stabilize the security situation, get rid of the immediate threat and presence of Boko Haram, especially the most pernicious militant elements, and then they can start to address the root causes. Unfortunately, um, and not to be too pessimistic about this, I think what we see as a legacy of conflict in Africa is that governments and institutions and actors are very much willing to engage in the kinetic portion of solving the problem. It's a much more difficult, much more long-term, and much more intractable problem to solve what you're talking about, which are the systemic causes. Yeah. Um, um, just a quick follow-up. Um, Kast, you, uh, is it your impression that uh, the average Nigerian think that there's being done enough to address these root causes? Uh, it is my impression that the average Nigerian absolutely does not think enough is being done. Um, they. Nigeria is, Nigerians are very sophisticated and very politically savvy, actually. So they see the military action for what it is. But one of the chief complaints, and I think, frankly, it was one of the chief reasons that President Goodluck Jonathan was ousted, the first sitting president in Nigeria not to win a re-election campaign. Um, and that's, that's a difficult thing to do, especially if you believe any of a modicum of the allegations of corruption and, and rigging of the elections and any of that. Um, absolutely, like especially in the North where President Goodluck Jonathan, frankly, campaigned extraordinarily lightly, right? Or predominantly Muslim population. He did not have uh, a lot of presence in the North. And certainly there, they have not felt the benefit of the rest of the boom of Nigeria's economy. So um, to succinctly answer your question, I, absolutely not. Nigerians, especially in northern Nigeria, feel like much more has to be done on the development front. Okay. Kaz, thank you for this opportunity. It was wonderful speaking with you. Thank you for joining us uh, from Denmark. Thank you. All right, Kaj. Hey, we're almost at the end of the show. Uh, there's a video message from Kayla uh, who sent this to us from Auckland, New Zealand. So let's take a listen to that. 
Hi Kaj, my name is Kayla, I live in Auckland, New Zealand and my question for you is what advice would you give to a recent journalism school graduate who's aspiring to be a foreign correspondent? Um, it's not really covered in journalism school too much um, how to sort of get there and, and what to do when you get there and what challenges you'll face. Um, and considering all the work you've done and the work you've done recently with Boko Haram it would be really interesting for me to find out how you started and what challenges you faced when you started and how you overcame those those obstacles. Um, any advice would be fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, well, Kayla, thank you for your question. Uh, my advice is don't do it. You don't want this profession. It's, it's lonely, it's time away from your family. Uh, in all seriousness, I, I, uh, honored and flattered um, that there are aspiring foreign correspondents out there. I think it is extraordinarily important um, to be able to go to these places in the world and, and shine a light on dark places and tell stories that the, the public uh, hasn't heard before or to help increase people's understanding of these tectonic global events that, that have ripple effects throughout the world. Uh, so I commend you on your aspiration. There's no straight linear path to being a foreign correspondent or to being a correspondent in general. Everybody takes their own circuitous route. Um, I like, this is a little bit of a variation on like your 20s you learn and in your 30s you earn. Uh, but my only advice is um, as you're starting off, accumulate as many diverse experiences as you can. Um, and then your reporting will be the sum product of all of those experiences. Um, so gather as much information um, you know, read as much as you can, go to as many places as you can, and then somehow all of that will magically coagulate into a path towards being a correspondent and, and telling good stories. For me, the personal challenge um, in becoming a journalist and becoming a correspondent uh, was that I had no idea what I was doing. I came from a military background, and a month out of being out of the military, I found myself back in Afghanistan with a camera instead of a gun and I had to learn on the job. And what I did was I just sort of took all of my knowledge and that my kind of innate curiosity about how things work um, and I just tried to apply that to my reporting. So it's a long path, it's an arduous path, uh, but at the end of the day I feel that it's a virtuous path and, and I wish you the best of success. So thank you for your question. All right, man, you made it to the very end. So uh, why don't you say goodbye to the people at home? All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to On the Line. I really tremendously enjoyed the discussion. The full-length version of my film, The War Against Boko Haram, is up on Vice News. I encourage you to watch it. And let's please continue this conversation and this dialogue about this very important issue. And uh, we'll see you next time on On the Line.